Welcome back. Uh, before we get into this week's episode, um, which is all around Bitcoin, and I say Bitcoin and I'm not talking about other cryptocurrencies, uh, where we are today when I'm recording this is on the 4th of March, and we're currently sitting at $65,000 uh, a coin on Bitcoin. So when you listen to this, it'll be interesting to see where uh, where we are. But uh, obviously, with, uh, with any kind of investing comes an element of risk. And uh, with any sort of financial services products, there's also risk and there's compliance and there's regulations. And that's why we're really delighted to have Lexis and Nexus Risk Solutions as our sponsor of this podcast. Um, so a big thank you to them and their team. If you are looking at different risk solutions for your business, for your enterprise, then please do give the guys a shout. Uh, the link's down below in the comments. Um, uh, a business that's been around for many, many, many years, um, but are constantly innovating, constantly coming up with new ways to combat financial crime. So uh, uh, enjoy this episode. It's an interesting one, I promise you. So uh, sit back and relax. Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome back to Talking Success. Uh, we're on uh, another journey today. We're talking all things crypto. Um, we're not giving you investment advice, I promise. Uh, we're not going to be pushing any coins or even talking about sort of any particular coins or prices of coins. Uh, what we're going to be focusing on today is the utility behind cryptocurrencies okay and uh i'm delighted to be joined by lorian lorian gamaroff who is one of the co-founders at sempi uh who uh, i will give i will let lorian actually do an intro to today uh we both brushed our hair uh specifically for this podcast so we hope you enjoy it and hope our, our locks uh don't get in the way of uh our wonderful faces and our lovely voices uh lorian listen <laughs> great to have you on, on, on the show thanks so much for joining i know we kind of tried to get this done back end of last year, and uh, I think what with interview happening and uh, me being on vacation and then not being well, um, it was a bit challenging to get in. But anyway, we're in February, we're into February. It's great to have you on board. I know there's a hell of a lot going on in your world or in the crypto world, certainly in, uh, in South Africa, um, but perhaps we can talk a little bit more about what's happening across the continent. But before we get into all of that, I'd love to get a quick intro from you. Tell us a bit about who you are, where you are. I know you've got four four sons uh, and you're not showing us the rest of your room, but uh, give us an overview, Lauren. It's good to have you on board. Thanks. No, thanks so much for having me. It's it's great to be here. And, you know, you're, you're saying the, the busyness of your year and, and your life. And, um, you know, of course, the last few few years has been pretty crazy, you know, just pretty, pretty busy. Uh, just to think about the world, how how things are just politically, but then all, of course with AI, I mean, it just seems life is 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 just becoming a kind of whirlwind for most of us. And if you if you can't uh, keep up up to speed, you're going to be left behind. So um, yeah, it's it's it definitely feels like that. And um, uh, in terms of my industry and and the last few years of my life, I think. In fact, more than the last few years, more than a decade now, since about 2011, uh, I've been very much involved in the whole blockchain space. Um, when I first heard about Bitcoin, it was way before any of the crypto things had started happening, the exchanges, all that. It really was just this novel new payment system uh, that was going to be make things cheaper and more accessible. And so that's when I got involved way back then and uh, really have been pursuing that now for now, what's it? 13, 14 years. And, um, and so that's what I've been doing is trying to see, can we leverage blockchain uh, it, it, in all sorts of ways that can, can assist with uh, payments, bringing down the cost of digital payments, but then also ways that governments can use it and, and enterprises can use it for all sorts of use cases maybe that we haven't thought of. That's really just been my whole focus is around the original idea of of, of blockchain, which of course was Bitcoin, and that it was going to become this new kind of payment rail, but one that was compliant with all the rules around payments. It was a transparent ledger. Uh, it, yes, it was decentralized, but it was still um, a subject under the law in terms of computer law and financial law and all that, you know, the, the whole idea of mining and, and all that was actually uh, built to so that law enforcement could have control over it and regulators could have control over it but that message was lost and so for the for the last 13 years i've been trying to just keep that original idea of blockchain and bitcoin what it what it meant trying to create products which we can talk about my my company now 
um, and trying to realize what we call Satoshi's vision, which was Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin. And that's pretty much what I've been doing for so a long time now. You weren't that guy that sort of spent 30 Bitcoin on a pizza, were you? No, I'm not okay. that guy. I think it was a thousand or 10,000 BTC. But um, no, I'm not that guy. But I did have Bitcoin very early on, uh, when, before it really had any right. value. But for me, it, in those days, of course, it didn't seem that it could go in, in value massively. Uh, we, we, we were amazed when it got to a dollar. But also, uh, it's not that uh, I've been interested in it from an investment point of view. You know, I felt that the real value now was trying to build a an application or a technology that uses blockchain in the same way the internet made millionaires. It wasn't because you bought internet stocks, although, of course, people who bought stocks can make money. But it was the founders, you know, the tech startup guys, the, the Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. And that was my, and I went through that. I, I was a student, a computer science student in the 1990s doing computer science before the mm. internet took off. And was swept along, that was my career, was building internet, this internet world. And uh, so I always had that feeling of, no, I want to build companies. Uh, and uh, that's why I never got into the whole investment thesis around crypto. And of course, you know, that's really what it's become today. It's, it's gambling. Well, before mostly. we get into kind of the utility behind um, crypto and certainly what you're doing now and the projects you're involved in at the moment, um, I think it's important to um, sort of demystify the myth around blockchain and crypto. And you very eloquently sort of put it just now is that, yes, OK, people can make money by buying and selling and trading, you know, cryptocurrencies and altcoins and all of these other things. Um, but there is a fundamental user case around this or utility around cryptocurrency, which is payments, um, remittance, um, what what else would you say with uh, 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 transparency? What, what what else would you say were the core sort of fundamentals um, around cryptocurrencies aside from the you know get rich quick schemes? Yes, and I'm going to start right away with the word that you are using, the cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say these use cases, payments, remittances, and all that for cryptocurrency. I'm going to tell you cryptocurrency has none of those use cases. Cryptocurrency, which we can define, uh, and, and the way it's used today, has no, use, no you legal use case. Even though it can perhaps facilitate these sorts of things, it doesn't make it viable. And uh, so now that's why I want to differentiate between the word cryptocurrency and the original word that we started off with, which was Bitcoin. Bitcoin, as originally devised, uh, uh, was not cryptocurrency. Uh, cryptocurrency is trying to encrypt things and, and anonymize things and make things maximally decentralized so they cannot be controlled. That's what cryptocurrency has become. Uh, the original, again, the original idea of Bitcoin was quite different from cryptocurrency. It wasn't about anonymity or maximum decentralization. Uh, de decentralization, which was a term that became overused, was just for really redundancy uh, to keep the network redundant. But then, of course, this novel idea of making offline payments, digital cash payments, uh, not through a central server. Uh, it's a very deep subject we can get into. But really, the cryptocurrency idea is, is really a perversion of what, what is useful and has all those things, as you say, the, the low-cost payments, which is the Bitcoin blockchain. And let's just call it blockchain for now so we don't confuse people because even Bitcoin today uh, is confusing. There are multiple versions of Bitcoin. So the, the blockchain use case, which is a decentralized ledger, uh, with all the properties of Bitcoin, it has a proof of work, which just m means that it's, uh, it is in economically, uh, it economically incentivizes mm -hmm. miners. So the Bitcoin use cases as a decentralized ledger, that is very useful and practical for a lot of different things. Um, if you have an immutable ledger, it means that you can reliably trust it to store information, especially uh, things like in supply chains, if you want to track the provenance of items through a supply chain. You can log them to a, sure. a blockchain and uh, you would be able to edit those records. And uh, so it, it's a reliable thing. Also with time stamping. In fact, the way uh, Bitcoin's inventor uh, really uh, expressed the idea of Bitcoin was as a, as a time stamping server. In other words, a way that you can reliably date information and things. 
uh, and that's very in useful as well. So, so, and then of course, having a token on a blockchain uh, means that now you need to acquire those tokens so that you can go and use that ledger. And uh, with a su limited supply, suddenly you introduce this idea of a sound payment system or a money system, if you like, one where you can make uh, uh, payments in, in, in a low cost digital way. And uh, that's something that, that has intrigued me over the, the last mm. 10 years. Excuse me, I'm just going to... No, 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 you go, um, I, I, I think um, the, the world of crypto um, perhaps has been uh, sort of tarnished, I suppose, by what we've seen over the last, you know, certainly a few years. I mean, there was a, a famous case of a couple of South African brothers who, who ran off with uh, a vast amount of sort of... Uh, crypto holdings or, or funds then we had ftx um and we've got you know quite a few of these uh sort of situations that have occurred that i think the you know you speak to the public about uh the general public about you know crypto it's like oh that's risky oh that's kind of underground and it's uh you know it's money laundering and things like that so i i, I think you know it has sort of got that tarnish almost um and i think in some parts of the world or certainly some communities is almost a bit of a taboo subject um you know we can't talk about that but it's not real money and you're going to lose everything um but we're not talking about trading we are talking about utilities behind um you, you have mentioned bitcoin a, a number of times already um what is special about bitcoin versus ethereum or um I don't know, all, all the others um cardano and uh, xlm and xrp and all, all of these other sort of coins or frameworks um that are out there why why is bitcoin so different and from the sound of things you're and, and from the look over your shoulders as well your, your, your little bitcoin uh, side um it sounds like you, you've got yeah. sort of a reasoning behind that uh, i'd love to explore that yes uh there are many and uh we could we could go through all of them uh, i think the most important one though is uh if you want to think about the success of a technology uh, and we're not talking about a technology uh, an application of a technology like a, a car yeah. you buy a car and it's built with technology but you know that 10 years later there's going to be new technology that's going to improve upon it and, and so you that's not what i'm talking about what i'm talking about is a a a, a good example a good illustration of of a, a foundational technology is the internet mm -hmm. itself now the internet is based on a set of rules about how information moves across the network. We call that yep. the protocol. So when we talk about protocol, we just mean rules, uh, the way that we behave, the, the agreements that we make, that we stick to. And of course, children know this when they eat at a table, they know they can't play with their food. They have to eat neatly with their fork or knife or whatever it is. So the internet became a foundational technology because it defined a protocol and that protocol was set in stone. And that gave businesses confidence to be able to invest money to build applications on top of mm -hmm. that protocol. And so what made the internet so successful, and uh, this story is played out on other, with other protocols, is that it, it was defined and then set in stone and made stable. And no changes could be made to it thereafter. Obviously, there, there, there could be, theoretically, but fundamentally, the internet protocol hasn't changed. And, um, and that means that now uh, for the last 30, 40 years, we, uh, we've seen this explosion of the internet around us where there's apps everywhere and we're all online and we yep. can't live without it. Now, when it comes to a, a, a blockchain, you must think about it just like the internet protocol. A blockchain is a protocol. That's what we, we call it. And it's a set of rules. Uh, famously, the first protocol was defined in the Bitcoin white paper. That white paper just describes the rules of how the system should work. Now, a very important thing about uh, a, a blockchain and crypto and all that is if, they, if those projects want to succeed, they have to already state and stick to that philosophy that they're not going to change the protocol level. Uh, and so what we've seen, though, is that uh, all the, the people involved in crypto, they, they, they don't think of it as them building utility systems that uh, enterprises and corporations and governments can now start utilizing. A lot of what drives crypto is just this kind of cypherpunk uh, view that they want to create a, a systems that cannot be stopped 
by government that cannot be co-opted by large corporations, you know, owned by Microsoft or owned by Google. And so they don't have that sense of building out systems that are there to to create confidence in a in a capitalist world where entrepreneurs can come and just build on top and, and be willing to invest money in creating uh, apps and things. Because they for them, the, the, the most fundamental thing is the the, the flexibility and dynamism, dynamism, you know, just all these things trying to uh, t- trying to and especially uh, progressing uh, for most of the most part in a way that makes it more anonymous and more uh, uh, un- yeah. ungovernable. So, so already we can see that the seeds of all these crypto projects their, of their destruction is, has been sown within the, their fabric. And so that's why when I said earlier that Bitcoin itself has multiple versions because uh, some people in the Bitcoin community wanted to change the protocol because they weren't interested in creating a, a, a foundational protocol that governments and businesses and everybody could now start using. Uh, and so for that's when we had a split in the Bitcoin community where some wanted to change the Bitcoin protocol and others didn't. And that's why today we have three main versions of Bitcoin, each of them uh, uh, starting off from the same protocol. And now uh, uh, BTC, for example, made very fundamental changes, uh, first of all, uh, and not to get too deep into it, by removing signatures from transactions. Now that just signals that they are not interested in in creating a technology that is adopted by sure. by the world, at least, at least from a you know from a, a corporate government uh, type of thing, it's just for the people. So when I say Bitcoin, I, I don't necessarily mean the the Bitcoin that you see people trading on exchanges today, uh, but what I mean is that original protocol, uh, first and foremost, because there are a group of us out there, and that little uh, logo behind me is for the what is called the Satoshi's Vision version of Bitcoin, which is the original right. version. And uh, and why why is it so important? Uh, that, why do we believe that one will succeed? Well, because first and foremost, we've kept the protocol mm-hmm. set in stone. But I've I've already alluded to the other reasons. Um, and just let me just have another sip there. I think when I I'll be I'll be that's, talking a lot today. Good. It makes my job a lot. I'll tell you that, Lauren. Yes, and so and so another reason why um, we uh, we believe that uh, Bitcoin Satoshi's Bitcoin is going to succeed is that the way it was designed, as I have alluded to before, is that it's all it was designed to be regulatory Mm -hmm. compliant, so that uh, any kind of um, anti money laundering, um, terrorist financing, um, all all that kind of stuff uh, can be applied, as well as auditing and traceability of transactions and uh, uh, you see bitcoin was pseudonymous and not anonymous anonymous you know pseudonymous means you can see the transactions but you don't necessarily know who they are connected to uh, whereas an- anonymous means you, you don't know anything and so um, just based on its design of being a transparent ledger um, one that had had a, had a traceable nature you know every transaction is linked to the previous one um, also, uh, very interestingly, is that um, uh, the whole nature of scaling, which is something that, again, uh, divides the Bitcoin communities. Now, what does that mean? Um, the, the thing about the BTC community now, the one branch of Bitcoin who, who believe, uh, who want to make changes to the protocol, they don't want Bitcoin to become too big for the average person p- to be able to handle. You know, they believe very much that people should have servers that, or a laptop at home and they can run the Bitcoin blockchain and it's small and it's not uh, uh, too much data and bandwidth. And so one of the things that's divided the Bitcoin community was the ones who wanted to make the changes said that they want to keep the blocks of transactions small. In other words, the transaction throughput small so that uh, the common man, you know, common person can go and have a little laptop running the Bitcoin uh, node. Now, again, what they have signaled is that they don't want this ever to be used on scale, you know, on mass. They just want it to be used for people underground, making little transactions, sending money from one to the other. And um, obviously now that's, that's, that's hit a problem. And so they are banking on other technologies out there to try and do that. But whereas Bitcoin was always intentionally meant to scale, it was meant to grow massive, 
even in the writings of the inventor, he said that eventually these mining operations are going to be huge. They're going to be in yeah. data centers. There's not going to be many of them. And uh, we need that so we can scale commercially. So that's another reason why when we look at these other cryptos out there, most of them are not trying to figure out a, a, a massive scaling situation. One that, um, again, involves large entities, corporate entities. And why do they not want that? Because remember, they have in their philosophy, and this is crypto generally, they don't want Bitcoin or crypto, not Bitcoin, crypto, centralized into a few organizations around the world that can then government and, and sorry, law enforcement can come and knock on the door and say, hang on, what are you guys doing here? Give us the keys. We're going to seize yeah. all your equipment. So the crypto community always want to keep it small, keep it hidden, keep it underground. And so that means they, they can't scale it massively. So uh, uh, that is a very critical part of this whole thing. Not only must we have a legal system, it mustn't be anonymous. It must be pseudonymous. We must be able to link identities to those transactions. And that's CentB. CentB has a role in that because we do uh, KYC verifications on our customers. We then link them to their transactions. And when we do need to present that information in a case or something, we can then show uh, that information. Now, with, with these cryptos, they're trying to obfuscate mm -hmm. that and hide it. So the original idea of Bitcoin, when, when, when Satoshi Nakamoto came along and invented it, the amazing thing about it, it's not this technological marvel, but what it is, 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 a, is a combination of very deep insight into how payments work in, within the legal frameworks and regulatory frameworks, how economics works. And he, he put that together to make a, a system that won't be something that governments want to shut down. But the irony is, and in fact, I, I gave a keynote at the Africa RegTech last year, and I'll be back uh, there in Lagos again this year. Uh, uh, and when I was at that, key, when I gave that keynote, I said regulators mustn't look at how to control. That's not their own. That's not what they should be focused on. It's trying to control blockchain, but trying to bring it in and trying to leverage it to to see if they can uh, um, improve their systems and their services. And there's plenty of ways to do that. So you ask me the question: Why do I believe that? It's going to be the Bitcoin, the Satoshi's vision version of Bitcoin versus all these other cryptos, Ethereum and all that. What makes it different? Bitcoin had a unique combination of ingredients. And this is why it was, uh, you know, it's been, it's heralded, to, heralded today as a, a, as a marvel and the, the guy should get an economics Nobel Prize, you know, because he brought these dis different disciplines into a, into a great system that could come onto the world, that would be embraced, that would eliminate fraud, it would bring down the costs of transactions. It would enable cross-border uh, payments at low cost. Uh, he didn't come into the world, and this is the, the biggest misunderstanding. He didn't come and create Bitcoin to be a system that could be outside of the control of all the, you know, all the regulatory authorities. That was this anarchist dream of being able to create a system that was untouchable and, and unstoppable and uncensorable. You know, those are the words they use. Uh, but... Clearly, that's not how things are going to, to pan out. You know, that was well, a long explanation you, on uh, why uh, things oh, I certainly learned a lot just now, so thank you for that. Um, it, it was interesting. When, when I met your business partner, uh, Angus, uh, back in the last year, we were chatting sort of through this, and uh, we'll come on to, to send me in a second. Um, and he mentioned, you know, using the, the, the Bitcoin sort of protocols. Um, and I remember sitting there going, why are you doing that? Because everyone says it's so expensive. Um, obviously, you've got volatility, but you've got volatility in kind of any digital currency, um, unless arguably it's a stable coin. Um, and I, I didn't really understand the strategy or the thought process behind uh, Incendi's business using, which we'll come on to in a minute, but, but using kind of the, block, uh, the, the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, now you kind of explained it, uh, I completely get it, <laughs> which is a really good segue onto kind of Sempi and what you, what you guys are doing down there. Um, but perhaps you can give us an overview in terms of what the, what the business is. And I know there's a couple of different things that you guys do, but what the business is, um, where you kind of focus on, on, on what the kind of the uniqueness is around the, the services and the products that you offer. Yes, uh, and uh, I can tell you this, that my 
vision and my goal uh, in, uh, has been the same since 2011 when I first heard about Bitcoin and it was just the early days when it was just about this low cost digital right. cash system. Uh, that's what hooked me. And since that day, I've been progressing to, to try and make that world a reality where people can easily use Bitcoin as cash, which is what it was described as digital cash. Uh, and they can use it instead of physical cash. So for low cost things, you know, buying a pack of gum or, or, or buying some electricity, topping up your phone with data, uh, getting an Uber, uh, shopping at the local supermarket. Yeah, you know, that, that was my, my vision was I wanted to now bring it. And in fact, I'll, I'll tell you why that even got started and I can go back a bit. Um, when I first started getting involved in Bitcoin, uh, I was working at a, a smart energy startup where we were creating uh, smart metering systems and, and payment systems so that uh, here in South Africa, Africans could buy electricity. But we had this issue with cash. Uh, that's, that was an inconvenient way of doing it. They didn't have cards. And so I was looking at ways that people could buy electricity. And that's when Bitcoin came along. And I thought, great, a digital payment method that's going to be really convenient. And that's what gave me this, the last 13 years uh, vision is to try and create a, an app that people could buy electricity and buy the things that they want. Uh, if you're interested more in that story, there, there's even a TEDx talk that I gave oh. in Switzerland. Uh, you can just Google my uh, we'll, or YouTube we'll my name. We'll, 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 we'll put the link here so you can uh, have a watch of this. Absolutely. Yes, Gamma of TEDx, you'll see the story of that. Uh, in fact, there's even a documentary called uh, Banking on Africa, which is also on my YouTube channel. Um, uh, it's, it's a general crypto documentary, but uh, my story is featured there where I created this, this uh, system for us, local school and all those things. So you can go and check this out. But um, the, the idea was then to build, uh, uh, make it, it easy for in, here in South Africa, people to use Bitcoin, get it, spend it. And that culminated now in the company that I am the CEO of, which is called Centbee. Um, and Centbee is a wallet. Uh, it's, it's a mobile money app, in fact. Uh, I categorize Centbee in the same way if you look at Impeza or Airtel Money or Momo, yep. MTN Momo. Um, Centbee is a mobile money app, except it uses original Bitcoin, which is a BSV, if you look at it on exchanges, the, the, the title of a Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. Uh, that's the low cost digital cash that Centbee uses. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, and that gives us the ability for you people to be able to buy very low cost things. We, we've integrated uh, gift cards from around the world. So it's not just in Africa, we, we're actually uh, around the world. Um, and you can now go and use digital cash in, in the form of BSV to, to purchase things. Also to send money to people. So it's a, a great P2P system. And of course, uh, cross-border. We ha we have the ability for you to send cross-border because it's global digital yeah. cash, but we can then yeah. allow you to send money directly to a bank account or a mobile money account or um, a cash collection in uh, a whole bunch of countries in Africa, uh, Brazil, um, yeah, around the world. You can you can do this. So really, that's what we're trying to do. Is we're trying to make the original idea of Bitcoin, which is digital cash, uh, create a wallet, use it like mobile money become a mobile money replacement. We, we want to take on all those mobile money companies. Uh, we think we've got, got what it takes to do that. Uh, so, um, and we're growing strongly, especially in Nigeria uh, and, and places like that. So yeah, check out Centbee. We've also got a, a show. If you want to check out the Centbee show uh, I, with my colleague, we, 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 we talk about uh, Centbee and we talk about uh, Bitcoin uh, and also try and dispel the false narratives in the same yeah. way we're doing here. Um, about what I've got a million mentality. questions, but I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, but l l let's talk, talk about the remittance side, the P2P side. Um, obviously, in, in Africa and in other countries, um, we're governed by quite strict exchange controls um, when we are moving currency, foreign currency, in or out of the country. Um, how does that work from a, a SMB perspective or you know, digital, digital cash? If I'm sending money to a relative in Zimbabwe or Uganda or Tanzania or wherever it may be, um, I, I assume the, um, it, it's on me to disclose that uh, under my sort of, uh, or to, to SARS and the revenue authorities that actually I'm making this transaction. Um, is it quite complicated? I know when I'm receiving funds from an overseas you know, customer, I have to go through a whole lot of uh, sort of tick boxes on, on, on the banking system just to collect, you know, $50. Um, 
is, is, does that add a layer of complexity to what you guys do, or is there a way around this that you you found obviously compliantly and legally? Yes, it does add layer of complexity, but we just have to comply. Uh, we 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 are an accountable institution and now soon to be licensed, so we have to just follow all the same rules that all the other fintechs that move money cross border have to comply with. We we have to do an extensive KYC process where we validate your document and your and your face, and uh, um, we we have to enforce limits. So we have very conservative limits at the moment. You know, we we're looking at uh, we started off where where St. B was kind of looking at that lower lower LSM uh, people who send about uh, you know a couple hundred uh, I guess dollars yeah. a month uh, home once a month to their family. So we decided to start off with very low limits, uh, a few thousand dollars a month type of thing, um, and. Um, and so with the KYC process, with that in place, also, of course, we have to do AML. So we have to make sure that users aren't skirting around the controls. Uh, and that's that's very uh, onerous. You know, we have to make sure that users aren't creating multiple accounts or using friends sure. accounts and sending to the same bank accounts. And you know, there's there's a lot of different uh, checks that I've personally had to go, go through, uh, you know, with Sentby, making sure we close those loopholes. And so that's just uh, the nature of it. Uh, uh, of course, when it comes to interacting with the local currencies, uh, there's always going to be switching costs and compliance costs there. That's just yeah. unavoidable. But really, yeah. if you are in a BSV or Bitcoin uh, world, there hasn't been any explicit uh, uh, controls over how much uh, users can send if it's only working within the BSV uh, economy. So there we don't keep track of that. So it is very possible for you to send uh, a sort of larger amounts across border. But then, of course, if you want to convert that into local currency, you're going to have to go through those compliance yeah. checks. You won't be able to just move huge amounts of money. It's very difficult, especially because of our target market. Uh, you know, we, we're looking at that teenager student market. If you look at our advertising, uh, if you follow, follow us on, on Twitter, you'll see that it's got a very youth focus. So we, we think that's going to be a good niche uh, for, for, for these mobile money products, especially with youngsters today who are just born with screens. But yes, yeah, so just to, to sum up, you know, we, we do have to go through uh, all the right sorts of controls. Uh, and uh, it's because we want to provide a, a useful service to users. We, you know, we want to stay within the rules of the law uh, because we want to grow. And we, we believe that uh, by doing that, uh, we'll have a much better chance than all these crypto people who think they can just do it through force sure. of their own. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the other, I suppose, concern, not concern, um, but maybe public opinion or public view, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're clearly the subject matter expert in this, is, um, you know, I, I speak to people and they're concerned about the volatility. They're concerned about the volatility of, okay, I buy... For example, I buy one Bitcoin today and it's worth $51,000. Uh, I wake up tomorrow and it's worth $35,000, right? So um, you've, you've, you've got that degree of uncertainty. And I think you, you mentioned that word very early on, and I'm pleased you did. It's, it's almost like gambling, right? Um, how do you ensure mm -hmm. that consumers, your consumers, your customers who are coming onto the Sempi platform, um, either are, are, are aware of, of a risk or have you mitigated the risk? And actually, there, there is very little because of the protocols and the type of um, services that you offer. There's very little um, exposure to the volatility of the market. How, how does that work? Yes, you know, this whole volatility issue, of course, and it's a sad result of the whole crypto craze that took off after Bitcoin was uh, delivered to us. And, uh, you know, this idea of speculating and my crypto is going to go up higher than your crypto and let's just take a punt and flipping and pumping and dumping. You know, th that all is is that whole perversion that I mentioned, uh, you know, taking now a, a generally useful thing into this um, world of uncertainty. And, and of course, this is why we have all these scammers because uh, we hear people getting rich and everybody wants to get in on it and scammers just swoop in. Uh, it makes the regulators antsy because now they have to watch out for potential businesses who, who on the surface looked legit, but now they're just going to walk yeah. off the money. So this is just a, a very sad result of what's been going on. Uh, I, and, I, and I'm really hoping that it uh, eventually, fall, uh, will, crypto will eventually fade away. 
and 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 then we'll see what happens afterwards. But in terms of of volatility without that, let's just imagine there wasn't any of that. Uh, where would we have been? Because of course, I'm still an advocate of Bitcoin. I believe in it on its own, I, and also. Uh, I, I believe there'll only ever be a single blockchain, just like we have a single internet, and that's the one. Um, but of course, how then would uh, the, the volatility uh, be affected? Of course, it, it, we would look at it and say, well, just because there's one crypto doesn't mean uh, it, there's not going to be volatility. Now, we, that, that takes us back to the whole utility aspect of Bitcoin. You see, when you do just have a token that just gets flipped on exchanges, well, that is gambling because you're not trading any fundamental value. You know, there's no asset underlying any of these things. Uh, you can't even use the blockchains for all those reasons that we went through. But if you looked at Bitcoin, and this is really why you've got to look at it as a utility ledger first and foremost, because without that utility ledger, in other words, a useful platform or, 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 or thing that we want to use for our day-to-day -day lives, without that, and if it's just a token, then how can anyone really think that it has value? Sure, it can have a price, but the yeah, two are very absolutely. different. And uh, unfortunately, when we look at BTC today, uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to call it out specifically because you know, I, I'm talking about the Bitcoin. So Bitcoin and BTC, uh, which is the one traded on exchanges and the highest value, really all you have there is a token because you can't use that ledger for anything. It's mm -hmm. too expensive. So, so when you have a utility ledger, now suddenly you have a fundamental, uh, something that you can, you can look at and say, how useful is this to me? And if Bitcoin does become a utility ledger, one that can provide services and, uh, and, and make things more efficient and enable new business models, if it can do that, then what's going to happen is we're going to have a natural demand for the token. And if there is a supply that we already understand, that fixed supply, well, now we are going to have demand and supply. And so if Bitcoin, any Bitcoin, even the original Bitcoin, if nobody can figure out a use for it, it's not going to be a stable store of value. It's not going to be anything. It's just going to be a token we flip on exchanges. And that volatility will never go away. And it will never become a useful form of cash or anything like that. So... What Sentby is unfortunately living through right now is a world where BSV is still lumped together with crypto. Most people don't know the difference. Second of all, because of the, the uh, regulatory uh, reluctance to uh, grant uh, Bitcoin companies, entrepreneurs who are, are looking to find licenses so that they can make the, get, make the right partnerships, uh, uh, because regulators are so, uh, you know, uh, not really keen to because of crypto. Um, so what, what's happening is that is everything is delayed and we're waiting to see if BSV, Bitcoin SV or any crypto can suddenly become a utility, not suddenly, can eventually become a utility ledger. Now, I believe that it will. You know, I've been studying blockchain and BSV blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain for more than a decade. This has been my world. And uh, in fact, before I even started uh, uh, with Sentpi, you know, I had a few other companies in blockchain. I had a, a, a training academy and a, a, a consulting advisory company doing blockchain advisory to corporates and governments and that all around the world. And I now am convinced that there are many serious and, 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 and now, uh, especially if you, if you look for it, well understood use cases. And all we now need are those entrepreneurs to start building out those products to get to that point where everyone can see, oh, this is a useful thing. Great. Now we, we can get there. So I'm actually, unfortunately, ahead of my time. You know, I, I started conceiving of Sentby in, in 2011. Uh, ten years later, more than ten years later, now I have it. And it's still, the, the, because of crypto, the industry is still lagging. And I'm just hoping I can, you know, keep staying here and, and getting market share and slowly users can start uh, getting on board and seeing what's going on. And eventually, once crypto is cleared out, which I, like I said, I do believe it will be, I mean, it's illegal and scammy and regulators are coming after it. Um, when, when we start seeing these use cases, then, of course, we'll see a natural price versus, you know, what's going on. The, uh, people demand supply. That's what we want. We want a natural supply and demand economy, not a speculative economy. And I'm hoping at that stage, 
BSV as, as cash becomes much more stable. Now, I'll be honest, when that's going to happen, I have no idea. I hope it's relatively soon, uh, as long as my investors can uh, yeah. hope for. Um, and, uh, but if I can crack through that, then I believe uh, we'll see co companies like the mobile money companies in Africa, M-Pesa, we'll see everybody jumping onto it. Uh, they'll be they'll say oh right well it's just like the internet then it's just a blockchain yes okay it's you know it's not the scary thing if you're old enough to remember the 90s oh, yeah. i'm sure yeah. uh the internet was a scary thing uh until we figured out how to use it uh and i feel like blockchain's on its way there eventually um, I, I, i've got kind of a, a, a last question for you um around the whole sort of utility around uh you know behind sort of blockchain and what have you. And sorry, I should mention as well that, uh, you know, I, I think the regulators, certainly here in South Africa um, and in other parts of the continent, other parts of the world, are now looking at um, digital currencies, uh, whether it be central bank digital currencies or whether it be crypto asset service providers, they're, they're looking at licensing. And I know Sembi's quite far down the line with uh, the licensing application here, here in South Africa, which is a, a wonderful thing, right? It really is. I think it legitimizes, you know, the whole sector. Um, but my, my last question to you, and I, I, I've covered this a couple of times recently, and I, I think I know the, I think I know what your answer is going to be. Um, but there, there's a lot of talk around using stable coin as a utility and the stable coin actually being this um, platform in order to transact and for me to send, you know, I'm going to send my dollars to you in the UK um, and I'm, I'm just using a stable coin to do that. And therefore, zero volatility in theory. Um, do you see, is, is there a difference between the stable coin and the BSV that you're talking about? Um, is stable coin still classed as a blockchain technology or is that a digital currency that's not necessarily got the utility behind it with all the things that you've just discussed I, i'd love to just get your um view on that right so leaving all all my 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 political philosophy or economic philosophy <laughs> behind in terms of whether i think stable coins themselves linked to fiat currencies are going to be worth anything I, i'll leave that one aside but let's just talk about the implementation now, as we've been saying, and what I believe deeply is that blockchain is a protocol layer that is, is going to be and can be used for all sorts of use cases. And the one use case, the one that I'm interested in is using the native token as cash, uh, because I hope eventually it will become stable and, and you can just use it straight off the bat. But there's nothing stopping other people coming and creating other applications and use cases on top of the blockchain that aren't directly related to the Bitcoin token. So, for example, when we talk about stable coins, yes, that is a perfect use case to go and build a stable coin if you want a stable coin, if that's what people want and that's what is needed. Absolutely, go and build a stable coin on top of the blockchain because you have the uh, all the security and all that whole business, uh, the way that the blockchain is, is uh, supported and maintained, you've got all that for free. You don't have to go and now set up a network that's going to be uh, interoperable. And I mean, if you think about people, uh, for decades, people have been trying to figure out these interoperable True. payment systems. You know, we've got Swift and all that, you know. Um, but go, if you want to have a stable coin and you want it to be secure and you want it to be peer-to-peer -peer -peer and you want to do all those things, Go build it on the blockchain. Uh, and so I, I think that uh, uh, stable coins are great ideas uh, for, for blockchain. And again, that if, it, if we do build a stable coin on top of the blockchain, well, guess what? It makes that blockchain now more valuable because it's now being used. It's a useful yeah. thing. So these are the kinds of use cases that I'm, I'm talking about. We did talk about other ones, but stable coins, absolutely. I, I mean, whether the stable coin itself has its own value, of course, that's up to the issuers and the governments and the, and the taxpayers and all that. But, but uh, uh, it, that is an example of it, the kinds of use cases that we hope to see. And, uh, and uh, so I, I, I'm very keen uh, on that. And in fact, uh, uh, Centby, uh, well, when we look at uh, using BSV natively as a token, you, you know, there's nothing stopping a wallet like Centby from incorporating a stablecoin 
uh, into into it by and using it on the BSV right. blockchain. So SendB already has that capability. Um, and uh, I do think this is, in fact, how it's going to unfold. I don't think the world is now suddenly going to flip and say, all right, we all want BSV and we, you know, national currencies are going to disappear and all that. Look, that would be nice. Uh, and that's, that's that whole idea of a sound money, you know, a fixed supply and all that. But that, it's not, not, it just doesn't seem like it's likely. So I'm hoping that uh, countries around the world all start looking at it. You know, with these CBDCs, again, whether you like them or not, uh, the, the CBDC is going to have a huge problem trying to create a payment network that works like cash. And guess what? Bit Bitcoin solved that problem. Uh, this is the, the amazing thing about it, is that it solved problems that we've had forever. How do you create peer-to-peer -peer transactions offline with digital payments? Uh, Bitcoin solved that. Uh, so, so if the CBDC wants to succeed, it's going to need a technology like Bitcoin to be able to make it work. Uh, and uh, uh, and this is uh, what I do a lot of uh, speaking to central bank governors and and excos and all that I've done that many times, um, and said to them uh, just like I spoke to the regulators at the Reg Tech Africa and I'll do again this year. Uh, go and you want a CBDC? Go and leverage this uh, uh, blockchain. It's it's scaling massively. The community around it uh, is uh, is it has because of that philosophy of a stable protocol, a massively stable, uh, scalable, stable, stable you, protocol. You just say. Um, it means, <laughs> yeah, it, it means now that uh, if you're looking for a solution for your CBDC, there it is. Go and implement it on that blockchain, and uh, it's just going to make uh, it that blockchain now fundamentally valuable. And uh, until we see that with any blockchain, until the day comes when you see a blockchain with a, a core, an enterprise customer or a, a bank or a, a maybe a, a small local government or something, somebody using that blockchain, then you can say, all right, now that's a, if we're talking about investment now, that's a blockchain that, that might have legs because now we're seeing adoption. Not, adoption doesn't mean I've bought crypto. This is another misnomer. You know, they say it all the time. Bitcoin's adopted because there's this many holders. That doesn't make you an adopter. <laughs> an adopter is you are using this, the technology. Uh, and so uh, amazingly now, the, Bit the BSV blockchain has already got those sorts of uh, projects going on now with governments. Nigeria is a very good example um, where uh, a BSV blockchain is now being looked at as a, as a, you know, a foundational enterprise layer that can now facilitate transactions and all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the power of BSV. Go check yeah, I must say, I, I, I do, you know, a podcast once a week and I've had some amazing people on. I really have. And I've learned so much about the sector, um, sort of generally in fintech. But in terms of learning about utility behind blockchain and Bitcoin and sort of where it's come from, what it's what it still stands for. Um, I've been blown away. I really have. I mean, I've, I've learned so much in just, you know, in 45 minutes. So uh, a huge thank you to you. Um, and as I said at the, at the beginning, I'm going to put some links down here to uh, Lauren's TED Talks and to SEMB. Please, if, if, if you're, you know, interested in the, in this world, um, check out SEMB. I've actually got it on my uh, on my phone as well. So uh, uh, check them out. Um, I, we've been through a whole... 45 minutes talking about Bitcoin, and I haven't even mentioned the halving, but I'm not even going to talk about that, right? That's that's the speculators. We'll worry about that later or, on. <laughs> or the Satoshi Nakamoto trial that's going on. That's the, the biggest news yeah. of Bitcoin and, crypto. I, I, did, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there a shortcut uh, code you can put into your uh, your Apple Mac? Um, Apple Mac, I sound like I'm from the 1970s. Um, your MacBooks, um, and you can get the whole Sen Sentoshi uh, sort of white paper. I'm sure I read that somewhere. There's a little uh, embed. Yes, I have, yeah. I have heard that. Oh. Yes, I have heard that. But, but, but I mean, right now, the, the, there's this uh, big uh, uh, trial going on in the UK. Uh, it, there are big companies like. Um, uh, Coinbase and uh, Meta was even involved, but then exited because they're suing a guy who who is saying that he's Satoshi and uh, they don't like him. But um, it could very well turn out uh, that um, Craig Wright, Dr. Craig Wright, who's on trial, uh, actually turns out to be Satoshi Nakamoto. So it's a very interesting uh, trial. Uh, it, it's uh, if you can find out more information, don't read any mainstream media. 
uh, you know, you can never believe that, but um, it's a very interesting trial. The trial of Satoshi Nakamoto. Maybe we'll finally find out who is the creator oh, of Bitcoin. Well, that'll be something, won't it? Um, we'll have to do a podcast on that one. But, Lauren, listen, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'll pop some links, as I said, at the bottom. People want to connect with you on sort of LinkedIn and Twitter and follow Sembi, and I'll put some uh, some other links there as well. But uh, good luck with the, the licensing application. Uh, your fingers are crossed. I'm sure you guys are going to breeze through that. And excited to see what you guys have got in store for, for this year and beyond. Take care.